I'll start now, and this is how it goes. I am a polar explorer. I am uh, one of a sort of dying breed. The uh, hazardous and operating environment that we work in uh, sees to that. <clears throat> but uh, perhaps slightly surprising for, um, for you, we do have a role to play. We are not dinosaurs. We have a role to play. Now, I'd like to uh, just run some images during the course of my presentation, and they're just going to provide a backdrop. It's there of uh, the work that I've done up on the Arctic Ocean, one of the world's fastest changing environments. And it'll provide a backdrop, I hope, to this concept, which is about the absolutely essential need, in my view, for businesses to start partnering with major natural science research programs that address the big environmental questions of our time. And that not only do they make these happen, they enable them to happen, but that they also work with the programs to share with a global audience the results and the consequences for us all of those results. I'd like to start with the dying words of, in the English language speaking world, one of the most famous explorers of all time, Captain Robert Falcon Scott, Scott of the Antarctic. Now, you may know that he didn't make it to the South Pole first. He was beaten in a race not of his choosing by Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer. And on his way back, they basically ran out of food. And there came a point when they knew they were going to die. And they set their tent up, and they lay down, and they waited for the weather to change. The storm never ceased. His colleagues died around him in their sleeping bags and literally began to freeze solid. Scott was the last one alive. And he wrote to his sponsors, he wrote to his friends, and he wrote to his wife. And the last letter he wrote was to his wife. And we know it was the last letter because he never signed it. He kept adding paragraphs between the other letters that he wrote. This is a man dying in utter isolation after the most ex one of the most extreme expeditions to that date in human history. And it was an opportunity for him. He couldn't be further away. It was as if, if space travel had been in, uh, around at that time, he would have been an equivalent distance away from civilization. You couldn't be, he couldn't be further away from his fellow man. And it was his big opportunity to m send a message to the next generation. And he did it by writing a note, a paragraph, to his wife about his son. He had a son who was age three, back in England. And the paragraph began, get the boy interested in the natural world. Some schools see that as more important than sport. It was the only thing he said about his son. But for him, the single most important message he could possibly communicate to his son was that. He was an explorer. Scott. Captain Scott was an explorer. His life was about discovering the natural world. And he wanted to pass on to his son that, in his view, this was something of supreme importance. Well, with Scott's death in the tent, in effect, a chapter was closed on exploration. Traditional exploration, as you and I would know it, perhaps, which was Explorers setting off on behalf of their queens and kings and governments to find resources, often in other countries. And in the process of establishing those, the location of these resources, they mapped the major geophysical surface features of our planet. So by the 1900s, we knew where everything was. However, there is a role for modern exploration, the new chapter. And Scott, in fact, was even a part of that with the major scientific program that he set in place down in Antarctica. Modern exploration goes something like this. 
if you accept that the natural world upon which we all depend entirely for our existence is showing signs of stress and strain in response to our human activities, whether at a local scale here on the island, or at a regional scale, or at a global scale, then presumably you would accept that we need to manage our relationship with the natural world better. And therefore, it is essential that we understand how the natural world works. We know where, basically, what the ex previous explorers had done was establish where all the ecosystems were, the river systems, the mountain ranges, the coastlines, the ice sheets. The work now for modern scientific exploration is to understand how the natural processes work, how the natural systems work, how they interact. What is the function, what is the role of life forms, plants and animals? We are just scratching the surface at this stage. There is a vast amount of information and understanding still to be delivered. And until we do, we, we are going to continue to scratch around in our abilities to manage our relationship better. Now, Peter, for that was his name, Scott's son, went on to become Sir Peter Scott, and he set up the world's largest membership organization focused on the environment, as some of you may know, the WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. That was how strong his, the message was. It really rang through Peter's life. It worked, that little note that his father wrote. But I would suggest that the scale and the number and the complexity of the issues that we now face in the natural world, the environment, is so great that the environmental uh, non-governmental non -governmental organizations really are starting to struggle with being able to respond effectively. It's just not realistic. I mean, there, there are a relatively small number of these organizations with relatively small uh, membership organizations, and you and I know that the scale of these problems is absolutely massive. They have done a fantastic job in flagging up to us over the last 50 or so years, what the issues are that we, start, we should start to be concerned about. And they've even started to uh, pr produce solutions to some, some particular uh, challenges, for example, protecting uh, tigers or protecting polar bears or protecting um, pandas even. But you can see it's hard work and we're slipping backwards. Now, it's not realistic to let them carry on trying to stagger under this growing burden. Something else needs to change because the policies at global level are not kicking in to start addressing these, um, these issues. And I believe that there's a reason why, there are a number of reasons, but one very big one that we can do something about is this. Global policymakers, on the whole, focused on environmental issues, know what to do. They know the speed of what they've got to do and they know the scale of what they've got to do. But they don't feel empowered to deliver it. Because the problem is that the publics that they represent, you and I in different countries, are not up to speed. We don't get this consistent uh, flow of high-grade scientific uh, information. We get a real hodgepodge from different media, through different media channels, of what's really going on. So I think that a critical next step in unblocking this sort of uh, constipation in the policy-making scene is uh, having a more consistent and better informed global public. That will give the policymakers the confidence to do what needs to be done. Now, how do we bring that about? Because the, these NGOs are, are, are not able to keep up with, uh, to, to deliver it on the scale that we need. And so what I would suggest is that business has a major role to play. If you think about it, the natural world needs to have more research undertaken. Businesses need to uh, know they now need to become more environmentally responsible, and they need to communicate their progress in that, in that area. 
And I believe that we need to have a much larger number of people engaged with the issues. Well, the wonderful thing about this is that there's an incredible confluence going on. The three things are coming together. We need a big audiences getting involved. Business needs to show that it's, uh, that it's uh, really addressing its responsibilities. And we need to have this research done. So a partnership between business and, the, and, and major research programs would seem to be heaven, heaven made. It's all there waiting to happen. And the interesting thing about businesses is that they have with them enormous audiences. If you, take, if you like, a typical uh, retailer might have, on a, on a national scale, might have 1,500, for the sake of argument, uh, suppliers. Each of those suppliers might say, for example, have 1,000 employees. Now, there are going to be 10 companies trying to get, win the business from that one company to become the supplier on that, of that particular product for, them, for the retailer. And all those employees have families. You can start to see that the numbers are starting to multiply out. And, of course, businesses, they have clients, and they have investors, they have local communities in which they're operating. And very often, they almost literally have an email address for every single person that I've just referred to. They've got really good direct access. So they have audiences that are currently not necessarily engaged with what's going on. And they also have expertise in communications. They've got uh, in-house teams and they've got external agencies who are gifted, gifted individuals and teams who are resourced to deliver messages with super efficiency, really hit the bottom when they want to where they want to. Well, if business is interested in, in, um, in communicating what they're doing with respect to the environment, guess what? The environment's going to win on it. We're, we're out on this in a major way. We're winning whole new audiences alongside supplementing the work of these uh, um, uh, environmental NGOs. Now, I'd like to give you an example. In uh, 2009, we set up Arctic Survey partly because the Arctic is, as I say earlier, one of the uh, fastest changing environments in the world. It's the biggest visual manifestation of this very nebulous concept of global climate change. You can see the sea ice, this white lid on the top of our planet, disappearing pretty much before your eyes. Now, what Arctic Survey was about was a team of three explorers working with uh, leading scientists in the University of Cambridge and we made a journey that could only be made by explorers to get some particular information from the surface of the Earth, rather like for hunter-gatherers becoming information gatherers. If we could just get that small body of information, it would have a disproportionately high effect on our understanding of how long before this sea ice cover on the top of our planet was, going to only become a, was only going to be a seasonal feature. It's been there for tens of thousands of years. We drilled three kilometers. If you added all our drillings together, the manual drillings, we drilled three kilometers through the sea ice over the period of about 70 days. And the average thickness of the ice, we discovered, was 1.8 meters. And the uh, average thickness, that was of the ice flows, the flat sections. If you added in the crunched bits as well, and the areas of open water, it was 4.8 meters. And what that told the scientists was that this area that we had surveyed was, um, ha had changed from its normal assumed state of having older, thicker ice. We, were, we traveled for the entire period um, over what was known as first-year ice, this thinner ice. And what that led the scientists to be able to say, and we created the platform at Arctic Survey for a global audience to hear, these results did not just get buried into a filing cabinet, that the emerging consensus among scientists in the sea ice field that uh, the sea ice may, uh, no, may become a seasonal feature in uh, 20 to 30 years was probably right, and nearer 20 than 30. There's a high probability that within 20, possibly 30 years, there's going to be a blue top to our planet. You can get there in five hours in a jet. It's quicker to get to this area of sea ice that I'm talking about, and it is to get to London. And people are sort of thinking, oh, that's quite interesting. And well, uh, 
Hello, there's some major outcomes from the loss of this sea ice. But the work of Arctic Survey was only partly about the science, because science is going on all around us all the time. Policymakers are awash in science. The key to what the survey did was that it reached out to an enormous audience. Over five billion opportunities to have heard about it on the radio, watched it on TV, or read about it online, uh, or in or newspapers was created. A thousand online websites clocked it. A, uh, over 90 television channels um, followed it. Uh, we had CNN, we had Al Jazeera, the BBC World. All the big players were tracking the progress, the human effort, this very particular human endeavor, reducing down this vast concept of global climate change down into three individuals trying to wrest from the surface of the planet some information that would help us to understand better what was going on. Now, I've, I have a link with Scott, because when Scott died, his son was um, looked after by a nanny, a governess, for five years. And for various reasons, she was instructed to toughen Peter up to the cold. And for five years, from the age of three to eight, Peter spent longer and longer with, uh, with less and less clothing in the outdoors in Britain uh, during the autumns, winters, and springs to harden him up to the cold. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Uh, and, of course, was brought up on the stories of his father and the other great men of, of his time. This lady then, in her 80s, came to look after me. <laughs> and my dad thought it would be a wonderful idea if I was given the same treatment. Well, actually, there are laws against that now, I think. Um, and it didn't do me any harm. But the point is, Scott closed a chapter on mapping where everything was. Peter, his son, partly and very much inspired by his father and nurtured by this lady, whose name was Enid Wigley, he took on the responsibility of building up from scratch the largest environmental organization in the world, the WWF. And I find myself carrying the baton on 100 years to the year after Scott's death in introducing a new sector, a new audience through, uh, through business. And so my parting message to you is to support, encourage, make possible, communicate, write to people that you work with in business where that's possible, and suggest to them that at any scale, if they can get involved, in supporting, funding, communicating natural science research programs, whether it's here on the island or whether it's on a bigger scale. This is something that needs to happen. And I think that it will break the deadlock, the frustration of which we all feel that things simply aren't happening fast enough and on a big enough scale to save our natural world upon which we depend. Thank you very much.